The following profile by Paradigm Media News is on George Jackson and the San Quentin Six. George Lester Jackson was born on September 23, 1941, on the west side of Chicago, Illinois. The second of five children, Jackson's parents, Lester and George, provided him with a relatively stable home. He spent time in the California Youth Authority in Paso Robles due to several juvenile convictions, including robbery, assault, and burglary. In 1961, he was convicted of armed robbery, stealing $70 at gunpoint from a gas station and sentenced to one year to life in prison. During his first years at San Quentin State Prison, Jackson became involved in revolutionary activity. He was described by prison officials as egocentric and antisocial. In 1966, Jackson met and befriended W.L. Nolan, who introduced him to Marxist and Maoist ideology. The two founded the Black Guerrilla Family in 1966 based on Marxist and Maoist political thought. And speaking of his ideological transformation, Jackson remarked, I met Marx, Lenin, Trotsky, Engels, and Mao when I entered prison and they redeemed me. As Jackson's disciplinary infractions grew, he spent more time in solitary confinement where he studied political economy and radical theory. He also wrote many letters to friends and supporters, which would later be edited and compiled into the books, Solid Dad Brothers and Blood in My Eye, bestsellers that brought him a great deal of attention from leftist organizers and intellectuals in the US and Western Europe. He amassed a following of inmates, including some whites and Hispanics, but most enthusiastically with other black inmates. In January 1969, Jackson and Nolan were transferred from San Quentin to Soledad State Prison. On January 13, 1970, Nolan and two other black inmates, Cleveland Edwards and Alvin Miller, were shot to death by corrections officer OPG Miller during a yard riot with members of the Aryan Brotherhood. Following Nolan's death, Jackson became increasingly confrontational with corrections officials and talked often about the need to protect fellow inmates and take revenge on corrections officers, employing what Jackson called selective retaliatory violence. Miller, 51, had joined the Soledad Guard staffing in August of 1962, a year after he retired from the Army as a non-com with 20 years service. As a guard, Miller had a reputation among prisoners and staff of being sullen and severe. He was probably the reason he was often assigned to standing watches in gun towers, where he would have little, if any, direct contact with inmates. Two days before the opening of the yard, Miller was checked out in the use of the 30 caliber rifle. As in the past, he performed well. The release for yard exercise began at 8.45 a.m. when W.L. Nolan's cell door was opened by a switch in the officer's area. Prepare for yard release, a guard yelled down the Max Row corridor. Nolan stepped out of his cell and walked down the corridor to the cave-like sally port. As directed by the mimeographed sheet handed out by Sergeant Maddox two weeks earlier, Nolan carried his clothing and a towel under his arm. Inside the sally port, he handed the guard the towel and his clothes, which consisted of coveralls, foam rubber shoes, a t-shirt, shorts, and socks. While the clothes were being examined for shanks and razor blades by one guard, a second officer conducted a skin search, looking for concealed weapons in the prisoner's mouth, under his tongue, in his hair, in and behind his ears, under his armpits, between his toes, under his feet, in and around his rectum and genitals. <laughs> the skin search is routine for all prisoners entering and leaving the maximum security cell area. Spread them, a guard ordered. Nolan was the first prisoner released into the yard. As he stepped onto the concrete pavement in the quiet gray moments of that Monterey winter's morning, he could look back over his right shoulder and see the armed guard, Opie Miller, above and behind him some 30 feet away. Nolan walked away from the gun, stepping across puddles of rainwater toward the handball area at the north end. Two whites, a lanky, lean-faced Chicano named Joseph Colorado Arias and Howard Smiley Hoyle entered the yard after Nolan. The make sheet on Arias described him as assaultive and noted that the Chicano boasts about disliking ninjas and considering them less than human. Hoyle was a racist himself. 
Just months earlier, he stabbed a black prisoner in another wing of the prison. Minutes later, Richard Cactus Ferguson, Hawaiian John Finney, and Billy Buzzard Harris joined these two near the hospital fence. Ferguson, 22, was do doing three to life. Finney, 24, was of Samoan ancestry. Solidad officials say he was not necessarily a racist, but identified with whites. Harris was a white supremacist, a member of the Aryan Brotherhood. By the time the white trio joined their comrades at the hospital fence, three other black inmates, Earl Satcher, Ed, and John Randolph were in the yard and joined Nolan at the far north end. The four blacks took a few steps to the center of the handball court and began warming up, slapping the handball against the cinder block backstop. Nolan and Randolph played for a while, but the ball sailed over the fence and they stopped. When someone threw the ball back over the high fence, Whiteside took Nolan's place. Satcher, both hands hanging onto the ends of a white towel around his neck, laughed and joked and acted as a sort of a greeter to the other black prisoners as they entered the yard. Raymond Guerrero, 29, a white inmate doing six months to 10 years for narcotics possession was another veteran of racial brawls. Solidad officials said Guerrero had just two months before this date been in a fight in which a black was badly beaten. Guerrero was the 11th man to enter the yard. While he was joining the whites on the south end, Hawaiian John Finney left the group, walked to the heavy punching bag along the O-wing wall and began pounding it. Between jabbing combinations, Finney looked toward the gun tower. He said Miller, the gun guard, held the rifle poised as if ready to fire. This worried Finney because he had been wounded in the yard at San Quentin and still carried the scars. Finney stopped working on the heavy bag and moved over to the speed punching bag where he kept watching the tower as he punched. He was watching as Miller aimed and fired his first shot. When Thomas Manyweather entered the yard, he automatically glanced up towards the gun tower and found himself looking into the muzzle of OG's carbine. Manyweather, Solidad officials said, had a serious disciplinary record. He made zip guns and bombs and had furnished them to other blacks on Max Row. When he entered the yard, Miller motioned him to the north end with a wave of the gun barrel. Manyweather challenged Randolph to a game of handball. While Finney punched the speed bag and glanced nervously at the gun tower, another white racist was clear for the yard exercise. Ronnie Harple Dean was a close friend of the whites, responsible for Clarence Causey's death, thus having earned a special hatred from the blacks who wanted to tattoo some knuckles onto the man's face. Harpo Harper joined the whites near the hospital fence. The last two blacks to enter the yard were Cleveland Edwards and Alvin Jug Miller. Edwards, 20, was doing a relatively lengthy six months to 10 years for struggling with the police officer. Solidad officials didn't like Edwards because he had a negative attitude towards authority. 23-year-old Jug Miller, who would die within minutes, was serving five to life for robbery. The last inmate to enter the yard before the shooting began was Robert Chuka Wendecker, 21, a white con who was doing six months to five years for possession of a weapon. According to prison records, Wendecker was noted for riotous behavior and had assaulted a number of inmates. Prison officials said that Wendecker, a Hawaiian, goes with whites when trouble starts. By now, 15 men had entered the yard. Each had been skin searched for weapons. Almost all were considered racist by prison officials. Almost all had a prison record of racial fighting. All were aware of the racial score to be settled for the Kazi killing. Since they were unarmed, no one expected to be killed, but a free swinging, knee jabbing, foot stomping melee was anticipated as guards, inmates, and prison staff awaited the beginning spark. It was like placing scorpions and black widow spiders in a shoebox. As O-Wing Administrator Eugene Peterson admitted in a confidential memo to the warden Fitzharris, most of the men in the yard have been to the other lockup prisons at one time or another and know most of the inmates in the other lockups. The hate or alliance go deep and many of our... The hate or alliance go deep 
and many are of long years standing, i.e. a friend of mine was stabbed by a friend of yours, so I'm going to have to stab you. The carnage began shortly after Chuka Wendecker entered the yard. Wendecker walked under the basketball hoop in the center of the yard and ambled over the fence, where he began talking to Harper Harris and Fanini, who had just stopped punching the speed bag. The four men laughed and joked about the ninjas playing handball, about getting out on the yard for the first time in more than a year, about the anticipated fist fight, and about the gun guard pointing the rifle around. When Fernandi left the speed bag, W.L. Nolan began punching it. Nolan called the Manyweather, who had been helping Nolan with his petitions against the prison, and suggested that they punch the heavy bag. Nolan worked with the heavy bag while Manyweather held it and watched. Manyweather had also been anxious about the gun tower. He noticed that the gun guard had his aim on them as they approached the bag and kept the rifle leveled at them while Nolan punched it. Nolan, who had won most of his boxing matches he fought in prison tournaments, had just given the heavy bag a few combinations when Wendecker approached the drinking fountain along the O-wing wall. As Chuko passed near him, Nolan yelled at him and threw a quick right, slamming his knuckles into the white con's forehead. Wendecker returned three punches, then decided that Nolan, with his boxing experience, was too big and too fast to square off against. Chuko dove for Nolan's legs, grabbing for his blue denim trouser legs, trying to pull Nolan down. Meanwhile, Fineni, who had walked up with Wendecker, was standing slightly behind Chuko. Fineni threw a few punches at Nolan, punches that whizzed past Wendecker's ear, but he missed. Fineni, his mind flashing quickly on the scar he still bore from the San Quentin yard, turned once more to look at the gun guard. He watched as OPG Miller aimed and fired. The first bullet tore into Nolan's chest, piercing his body just to the right of his breastbone. A white witness saw Nolan sag to his knees, clap his hands behind his head, elbows shaking and fall forward, his forehead slamming into the concrete. Wendecker said he kicked Nolan a few times, unaware that Nolan was bleeding to death. Manyweather, who had let go of the bag he was holding for Nolan, started for Chuko to stop him from kicking his black friend. He didn't reach Wendecker because Billy Harris and Harpo Harper jumped him first. Watch out, Cleveland Edwards yelled at Manyweather. Manyweather, a powerfully built man and judo expert, turned to meet Harris and Harper. He caught Harris in midair, letting the White Con's momentum carry him and threw Harris to the pavement. Edwards called that he would look after Nolan, but as he ran towards the fallen black leader, the gun guard squeezed off another shot. Edwards grabbed his stomach and fell on his face. The shot went through Edwards and smashed into Manyweather's left hand. John Randolph and Ed Whiteside were playing handball when they heard the rifle shots. Randolph started running, zigzagging toward the fence near the hospital, then back toward the shower stalls. He heard another shot. The bullet hit Jug Miller in the gut as Miller was running along the O-wing wall toward the fight scene. Randolph, who was just a few steps away, tried to grab Jug Miller to stop him from falling, but he couldn't. Miller was dead weight. He fell near the pull-up bar and speed bag as Randolph let go and turned to face Billy Harris, who had got up from the Manyweather's judo throw. Randolph and Harris glared. Randolph and Harris glared briefly at each other. Then, glancing at the carnage around him, Harris decided to stop fighting. He walked a few steps, paused, and then felt a burning sensation in his groin. He had been shot in the testicles. Satcher, who had been pacing back and forth in the northwest corner of the yard, also had headed for the fight. By the time he had got to the middle of the yard, at least three shots had been fired. Satcher squared off against Cactus Ferguson, each feigning with left jabs and threatening rights, but neither landed a punch. When the fourth bullet was fired and both men noticed that inmates had actually been shot, they put their hands down. Two of the wounded blacks moaned. Harris, a testicle shot off, sat on the concrete pavement, loudly cursing the blacks and the gun guard. Satcher cupped his hands to his mouth and yelled, it's all over with. Well, it better be over with, Opie Miller, the gun guard, yelled back. The four surviving black prisoners first tried to figure out who was the most seriously wounded. 
Satcher and Randolph kneeling over Nolan asked how badly he was hit. I'm probably hitting the leg, he said, but his shirt showed bleeding in his chest and back. The men decided to move Jug Miller. Everyone was now waiting for the doctor, said a witness, but after about 10 minutes, nothing happened. We then began hollering at the gunman in the tower to open up the emergency gate to the hospital, but he refused and just stood there with his rifle aimed at us. After about 10, 15 minutes passed, many weather decided to take Jug Miller off the yard. If you take another step, it'll be your last, Opie Miller shouted from the tower. Nobody leaves the yard until I get an official okay. If they don't get back, shoot another one, Sergeant Maddox yelled from the open O-wing door. By this time, Nolan had drifted into shock and was trying to swallow his tongue. While the blacks were arguing with the guards about taking the wounded off the yard, two white prisoners, Arius and Guerrero, moved to the north end of the yard and began playing handball. They played for about 10 minutes. The bullets that ripped into Nolan, Edwards, and Miller did not kill the men outright. According to witnesses, all three men lay bleeding in the yard for 15 to 20 minutes before officials would unlock any gates to take them off the yard. The guards never did unlock the two doors which led directly to the prison hospital. The three black inmates bled to death. Word of the triple killings flashed quickly throughout the Soledad mainline. Within hours, various groups of black inmates were demanding the arrest of the gun guard and a grand jury investigation. Investigators and attorneys from the Monterey County District Attorney's Office poked and probed, but after a passage of three days, there was no word on the progress of the investigation. The prison continued tense like a firecracker fixing to explode, as one inmate described it. During the evening of the third day, the Monterey County District Attorney told reporters in an interview that OPG Miller's killing of three black prisoners was, in his opinion, probable justifiable homicide by a public officer in performance of his duty. When the black inmates heard this report on television, they were incensed. Within an hour, a white guard named John V. Mills lay dying on the concrete pavement of Y-Wing. He died in the prison hospital without regaining consciousness. Mills probably never knew any of the truth about the killings on January 13th. His death was revenge, cold, detached revenge. Opie Miller, the man who shot Nolan, Edwards, Miller, and Harris, took an extended vacation in Germany. The Mills death, the first killing of a guard in Soledad history, resulted in the arrest of three black inmates, George Jackson, Fleeta Drumgo, and John Cliche. Due to the incredibly heavy-handed and racist treatment of these three men during pretrial hearings in Salinas, defense attorneys won a transfer of venue to San Francisco, and the case of the three men rapidly became a cause of celebrity in California. Movement forces called in the Soledad brothers, and their case, which was focused on racial injustice and inhumane prison conditions, began receiving wider attention and press coverage. It was not until August 1970, however, that the press really closed in. For it was then that George Jackson's younger brother, Jonathan, for it was then that George Jackson's younger brother, Jonathan, armed himself and entered the Marin County Courthouse. The younger Jackson emerged with five white hostages, including an assistant DA and a superior court judge. Hostages they wanted to exchange for the freedom of the Soledad brothers. In a murderous barrage of gunfire, Jonathan Jackson was killed. So were two other black inmates, James McLean and William Christmas, and the white judge, Harold Haley. Michelle McGee, one of the survivors in the van, is on trial for murder. Within days of the Marine Courthouse shooting, law enforcement officials reported that Angela Davis had purchased the guns involved in the kidnapping. Warrants were issued for her arrest and she was captured in a downtown New York motel nearly three months after this event. Federal authorities delivered Miss Davis to California where she was in prison at the Marine County Jail. Meanwhile, George Jackson had been transferred to San Quentin. On January 17, 1970, Jackson, Fleeta Drumgo, and John Cliche were charged with killing the corrections officer, John V. Mills, who was beaten and thrown from the third floor of Soledad's Y-Wing. This was a capital offense, and a successful conviction could have put Jackson in the gas chamber. 
Mills was purportedly killed in retaliation for the shooting deaths of three inmates by Miller the previous year. Miller was not convicted of any crime, a grand jury ruling his actions to be justifiable homicide. After the August 7, 1970 incident where George's younger brother, Jonathan, attempted to free him and his two co-defendants, George Jackson would meet his death not long after. On August 21st, 1971, George was expecting to receive a visitor that day while he was housed in the Adjustment Center at San Quentin. He kept asking the guards in the AC if his visitor had arrived and George seemed overly anxious for his visitor to show up. The guards said no, they weren't aware of any visitors showing up for him, even though they knew otherwise. Two people were waiting to see Jackson, but the visiting room officer had told the guards on the phone that they had not been cleared. The two visitors, a young radical attorney named Stephen Bingham and a black female activist named Vanita Anderson had signed in at the prison's East Gate at 10.15 a.m. Inside the East Gate, the two walked about 200 yards to the prison security fence where all visitors are required to pass through a metal detector. Purses, bags, tape recorders, briefcases, and similar large objects while not passing through the inspector scope detector are examined routinely by the guard at the gate. That Saturday, Correctional Officer Bernard C. Betts processed more than 225 visitors through his metal detector. It was not his normal duty station, but he had maintained the machine before. It was another routine day for Betts. A man wearing a leg brace set the metal detector off. So did a woman wearing a Naga hide coat with three inch metallic buttons. Steve Bingham passed through the inspector scope at about 10.20 a.m. Betts remembered that the young attorney was wearing a mod necktie and a corduroy jacket. His long hair combed neatly. Betts could not recall that the Berkeley attorney carried anything. Vanita Anderson walked up to the inspector scope carrying what looked to Betts like a portable typewriter case. Light complexion with a mild afro and wearing a pair of finely crafted copper earrings, Miss Anderson was dressed in a three-piece checkerboard suit. What's your title, Betts asked. I'm a legal investigator, she answered. Who are you going to visit? George Jackson, Miss Anderson applied. Betts instructed her to pass in the bluish gray metallic case, holding it away from the metal detector so the case would not set the machine off. She thrust the case towards him in a contemptuous manner and Betts began examining the contents. The case was about 20 inches long, 16 inches wide and some four or five inches deep. Inside, Betts found several inches of yellow legal sized paper and a tape recorder. The tape recorder was nine to 10 inches long, five or six inches wide and almost four inches thick. The guard carefully removed the back of the recorder and saw four C-sized batteries, various diodides and transistorized parts in the speaker. You're clear, Betts said to the woman returning the case. These details would later become important because it was alleged that a gun was hidden inside the tape recorder. Stephen Bingham claimed that at one point, Jackson asked him to step out of the visiting room so that he could be alone and review some paperwork with Benita Anderson. At around 2.30 p.m., the attorney signed out and left the prison. Officer Frank DeLeon came to escort Jackson back to the adjustment center. When Jackson was escorted through the AC front gate, Officer Urbano Rubiaco met him and Officer DeLeon at the entrance. It was then that Rubiaco claimed that he seen something shiny in Jackson's hair. Another officer, Kenneth McRae, claimed he seen the same thing. Rubiaco reached for the object, which then caused the magazine clip to fall to the floor. In one motion, Jackson then reached into his afro and pulled out a small 32 caliber handgun with another magazine. Jackson then slams in the other magazine and says, the dragon has come. At this point, Jackson orders Officer Rubiaco to open up all the cell doors to let the other inmates out, and he takes all the guards hostage. From there, the bloodbath begins. Over two dozen inmates are let out of their cells that included Johnny Spain, Hugo Pinnell, Luis Talamantes, David Johnson, Willie Tate, and Fleeta Drumgo. One of the other inmates that was let out of his cell, a white inmate named Alan Mancino, claimed that the Aryan Brotherhood wanted him to kill Jackson, but he wanted no part of it. Instead, he shot Jackson a kite and gave him a heads up as to what was going on. 
Mancino believes that this is why his life was spared after the carnage began. Mancino gave some of the details about what he personally witnessed that day. He said that he seen the guards hogtied and then at first they were being strangled to death with radio cords. But when these started snapping and it took too long, they started using tomahawks and razor blades to slit their throats from ear to ear. He said that there was blood everywhere and that the floors were covered in blood. He went on to describe seeing guards running around to get away. And then he said he heard moaning and that he seen the guards urinating all over themselves as they were being killed. Several guards were piled on top of each other and thrown into one cell where they could be heard gurgling and drowning in their own blood. He said it sounded like they were talking underwater when they were praying. At one point during the carnage, Jackson was overheard saying, it's time to see if this piece really works. And then officer Frank DeLeon was shot in the head. All in all, six officers were assaulted that day, but three of them survived. Officer Paul Krasnitz, Officer Frank DeLeon, and Officer Jerry Graham were among those that died. Other officers that had their throats slit but survived were Kenneth McCray, Urbano Rubiaco, and Charles Breckenridge. But the killing didn't stop with just the officers. Two white inmates were also killed that were housed in the Adjustment Center, John Lynn and Ronald Kane. Inmate Alan Mancino knew what was going to happen and told John Lynn to either get himself a weapon and get ready to fight for his life or to just simply wait around for it to happen. Lynn apparently decided against fighting and had hoped he would be spared. But when all the officers were dead, Jackson gave the order to kill both Lynn and Kane because they had seen too much and because they weren't one of them. Lynn and Kane suffered the same kind of agonizing death as some of the officers. They were held down and had their throats cut from ear to ear. When the killing was over, the floors of the adjustment center were covered with puddles of blood, smeared blood, and blood that had coagulated and pooled in almost every corner. You could smell death in the air. Mancino said he seen more that day than he wanted to and that he's still haunted by the memories. He said, when I didn't want to see the killing anymore, I could still hear it. He said there was a lot of crying, screaming, moaning, and begging. There were a lot of shut-ups followed by thuds or smacks. John Clichet described seeing Jackson walking around in the AC after the killing was over as if he was in a daze. He wasn't saying nothing. He wasn't talking to no one. He just had this blank look in his eyes, Clichet said. At one point, Supervising Sergeant Jerry Graham began looking for his officers as they had been gone too long. As soon as he walked into the adjustment center to make contact with them, he was immediately taken hostage. Within minutes, he was shot and killed. When Jackson took his shot, it was heard by other officers who began to respond to the AC. Lieutenant Richard Nelson was outside in front of his house that was located on the prison grounds when he heard the shot and began to make his way towards the adjustment center. As he was responding, he saw Associate Warden James Park running towards the prison and he yelled out, you better hurry up and get down there. Jackson's running around loose and he's got a gun. At this point, Johnny Spain and Jackson hunkered down at the entrance of the adjustment center's front door and got ready to make a run for it. Jackson looked at Spain and said, it's me they want. Then Jackson ran out of the entrance followed by Spain into a barrage of gunfire. Spain wasn't hit, but as Jackson was running, a bullet tore into his left ankle and momentarily slowed him down. As Jackson's adrenaline kicked in and he continued to run, he staggered, which caused him to bend forward at the exact minute a second bullet tore into his back and traveled up his spine. Because of the way Jackson was bent forward when the bullet hit him in the back, the trajectory of the bullet ricocheted off a bone and continued to travel a straight line until it exited out the back of his head. Jackson was dead before he even hit the ground. The shot came from an officer who was laying on the North Block gun rail. He aimed his 30-30 Winchester rifle at Jackson and took the fatal shot. Although George Jackson was now laying on the cold concrete dead and this saga was just about coming to an end, the dragon had still come. George Jackson was earlier quoted as saying, if I leave here alive, I'll leave nothing behind. They'll never count me among the broken men. When heavily armed officers stormed the AC minutes after killing Jackson, they found all the missing officers dead and piled up inside of Jackson's cell. 
They all had their throats cut and they had been shot in the head. This incident and the other six inmates who were allegedly involved is how the San Quentin Six got their name. August 21st, 1971, the day that George Jackson died is also how Black August was born. On this day, out of respect for George and to pay homage to his memory, the BGF will usually fast and commemorate George Jackson's legacy. George was a true revolutionary to the bone. I read almost all of his books, The Solidad Brothers, Blood in My Eye, Black August, Prisons on Fire, George Jackson Lives are just a few. His books and his writings are some of the best revolutionary inspired books that I've ever read. I hope you guys enjoyed this short tribute to George and how the San Quentin Six became part of black history. In 2015, Hugo Yogi Pinnell, one of the San Quentin Six, was targeted and killed by the Aryan Brotherhood in Folsom State Prison, days after he was released from the SHU. He had just spent 45 years in isolation. Paradigm Media News will be doing more stories like this as we want to expand this channel and get away from being one dimensional. If you guys have ideas that you'd like us to run a story on, put your ideas in the comments section and we'll try to get it out as soon as we can.